I never let her do it. All right, I'll do it. You do it. Okay. Then we, a couple of other things. These are what are called dead-on mics, meaning that in order to get the full sound, you have to be speaking directly right. to it. If you get off to the side too much, you see how I go down that far? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. It's not so like gotta a, be in like this. It's not like a music mic. As soon as you hear the intro, that's the only way we're going to be identified that we're on. So when you hear the yes. intro, okay, so we might be running a minute late. Okay. Once in a while, this radio station will start running commercials, and they and you got to speak right into the right into the right. Mic, right? Keep, keep yourself three to three to six inches away, three okay. to five inches away. If you get okay. too close, it, it normally it, it can vibrate. Yeah, vibrate. it gets a little bit too loud. And it's what? Oh, you just let me know. Go up like will, this or go down like this. We will make. I don't know if he'll know. We will make available uh, when the call in, but we're also going to make it available here. We're going to mention that we're right. live here, that your speaker's here, et cetera, et cetera. And let's have fun. Absolutely. I, I always have fun. Praise you, dear Lord Jesus. We Thank bless you today. Jesus. Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit and fill us. Just allow us to speak what you would have your people hear. And if we speak anything that is not of what you want your people to hear, then close their ears to only and only let them hear what you want. Praise you, Lord. Thank you for all the good you give us. <coughs> Good evening and welcome to St. Joseph Catholic Radio. I'm Rick Howick, your host, and today I am not coming to you from Southern California like normal. Uh, we're at a remote location in Fargo, North Dakota, of all places. Uh, a place where my understanding is six months out of the year is covered in snow. But today we're coming live from the Marian Eucharistic Congress, which this being the third one in six years, they do this every two years, has turned out to be just fantastic. One of the larger, one of the largest Marian Congresses that goes on in the United States, indeed in the world. And we are blessed to have with us today two guests, husband and wife, Bob and Penny Lord. First of all, Bob and Penny, welcome to St. Joseph Radio. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. It's a pleasure always to be on St. Joseph Radio. And would one of the two or both of you please lead us in a word of prayer? All right, I'll start. We praise you, dear Lord Jesus. We bless your holy name. Lord, we ask you to fill us with your spirit and just allow us to speak only the words that you want spoken to your people. And Lord, if we say things that you don't want them to hear, and don't let them hear, Lord, but only those things which you want them to hear. Dear Lord Jesus, we consecrate ourselves now and forever to your most sacred heart, to the reigning immaculate heart of your mother Mary. We love you, Jesus. Let us just begin to our brothers and sisters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy 
Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Gloria a Dios. <laughs> I don't know about you two, but I'm having a great day. This Praise is, God. Yes. This has been fantastic. It We've is. been here since, uh, actually, I got in here yesterday morning, but this conference began yesterday in the afternoon, and it has been fantastic. And we've been able to have some great interviews. The, the bishop was here. We were able to interview him. Oh, he's such Father a Straub was in mm-hmm. here. We've had a we've saint. had we've had several people in here that um, have not only been a blessing to everyone who's been able to listen, but I have the unique opportunity of coming to these conferences and being able instead of just in fact I usually don't get to listen to the presentations. No. Instead, I get to <laughs> I get to inquire directly <laughs> you, you from get the your sources. Own, you get your own presentation, which gives me the most fantastic experience that anyone could ever hope for, and I just I am so blessed in this. Place. Praise God. We're here today talking to you two for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're two of the speakers that are here as a husband right. and wife team making a presentation um, on your lives experience and I would like us to look a little bit before we go anywhere else in this conversation of which even though we're not in Southern California we will be opening this up Uh, it is a live broadcast from the hall here so if you hear any noises out there that's because we're actually broadcasting live from the hall we will be opening up to questions normally just like we normally do uh, at the 1-800 number and the 714 number but also for people here in Fargo who have questions as well from the floor. Wonderful. So before we go into any of the theological issues, I'd love to be able to talk over with you because your story is fantastic and it raises so many great issues. I would like to hear a little bit about how it is you came to be. How did you get invited here? <laughs> well, I guess that's, that's a, really the bottom line issue. Start because at the beginning? It goes right back to your beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the beginning is that we are uh, Catholics. We lived in Southern California, and we were normal, everyday Sunday go to church Catholics. Never did anything special. As a matter of fact, if we did anything, we were trying to protect our family from the world. We had a, a saying with our children: um, get in the house, lock the doors and the windows, keep the world out, and let's just worry about our family. Um, we did we, all the right things. Yeah, we sent them to Catholic schools. We lived in the best neighborhood. Kind of an isolationist uh, yes, approach. Yes, very definite. Which is American. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, uh, we, we didn't think that uh, drugs could come into our family. See, we kept the door locked. We kept the world out. We didn't care about the world. Did we, you ever read Edgar Allan Poe's The Mass for the Red Death? It's a, I don't think so. I read it to my eighth graders because it's grisly, and they like grisly, but it has a, a great lesson to it, mm-hmm. and it's about... This, this rich person who tries to lock out this plague yeah. out there. And of course, yeah. with that ground flow, the plague comes in anyway. Right. Well, and the same thing with us. Yeah. You cannot live an isolationist kind of, uh, type of, of uh, existence. No man is an island. No. We thought no. we could keep the world out, and our, our son died of an overdose of drugs at 19 years old. Um, Beautiful boy. Obviously, we didn't keep the world out. We found out that you cannot keep the world out. You can change the world. No, you and that's all you can do change is change the world. I, I want to stop right here for a moment. You just laid that on us. And, and I, I want to pause. When I was 19, a girlfriend of mine died from cancer. She'd been mm-hmm. with a brain tumor for years. And the grief for me was tremendous, but the grief for her mother uh, was mother and father, but her mother was overwhelming mm-hmm. and you just kind of went right past that and I want to find out well we did but we didn't because we were getting ready to tell you about okay I apologize oh, for no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. then then oh, bring us know, back into yeah. this we, we reacted that's profound tremendous thing we, we had uh, we had a, a great deal of anger see this young man of course every parent thinks that their child is the most spectacular child but this young man had a photographic memory, 4.0 student. Very compassionate. When we mean. moved from New York to California, the schools did not have enough to hold him. He went half a day to Jesuit High School in Loyola High School in Los Angeles, half a day to Loyola University because he was just <clears throat> so intelligent. So his, uh, by the time he died of this overdose of drugs, he couldn't fill out a simple job application. And this is a brilliant young man. But you know, we always thought he would be great. We knew he would do something great. And um, when we finally discovered that he was using drugs, I would go asking everyone, everyone. I'd meet strangers on the street, and I asked them to pray for us. 
See, uh, I wasn't brought up to pray uh, through the Blessed Mother. I didn't know her, even though I was a Catholic, and we didn't in ask the saints to intercede. Unfortunately, what you just described is not that uncommon amongst yeah. many, many, many Catholics. So uh, I would ask, even perfect strangers, please pray for my son. I prayed to the Lord that a stranger, someone would come and, and reach him. And a woman once told me, whenever you are afraid, worrying about your son, Take the face of Jesus and place it over your son's face. And I tried for about two months. Our son was away from home. We didn't know where he was. And every time I, I worried about him, I would see two faces, and that's the truth. One of Jesus and one of my sons. And as much as I tried to place one over the other, I couldn't. The night my son died, he called. He called my son-in-law, and my son-in-law called Bob. And he said, that. Richard wants you to come and get him. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. And uh, I couldn't help it. I, I was scared out of my mind. And Papa said, listen, we've always treated him, he was our youngest, as a baby. And we've got to give him this opportunity. He said tomorrow, we'll go and get him tomorrow. Treat him like an adult, he said tomorrow. And, and I said, I don't, he said, what's wrong with you? You should be happy. And I said, I can't help it. I am petrified. Mother's fear. and. Mothers are always right. Mm. Anyway, I, I started to pray. And I said, Lord, you gave me the most precious gift in life. Take him, he's yours. I didn't mean for him to die. I meant for him to take over his life. We felt that we had failed and we didn't know what to do. And, you know, just to back up for a minute, when the drug thing happened, um, it was new. This is the 60s. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to handle it. We brought him to psychiatrists. The psychiatrists had no idea what to do. They were using textbook uh, things to try and get this, uh, get it under control. They didn't know what to do with him. Well, one of them said, uh, who do you love more, your son or Jesus? Now, there is an instant response to this, whether you're a strong Catholic, a strong Christian. There's an instant response. I love Jesus more. Do you know after my son died, I kept screaming, I was lying. I was lying. I love you more. I love you more. And then, of course, a tremendous anger towards Jesus. Now, I'm a cradle Catholic. And um, I never, I had, you know, I knew all these things in my head, but I never felt any of them in my heart. Penny is an emotional Catholic, which I think was beautiful because she felt everything that she did. I've always been in love with him. And so this great love that she had for Jesus turned to hate because he had let he us betrayed. down, yeah. he betrayed us. The closest distance between two emotions is the distance between love and hate. Exactly. But you know, see, I believed as a child that they thought my husband and my children thought that was charming. And we never wanted her to know. We said, don't let her know what's going on. We want her to maintain this childlike knowledge of the church. Let her keep that, because once she knows what's going on, she'll be uh, disenchanted. But it wasn't childlike. It was childish. There's a difference. There is. Yeah. And I had a teenage love affair with my, with my Lord Jesus. And so I said, you tricked me. I will never believe in you again. And he tried. He tried, oh, so many times to reach me. We wrote about it. But my heart was of stone. And I, I just wouldn't believe it. I, I had signs, and I just wouldn't believe it. So when he got sick and tired of us ruining our life, and we were... Well, we, uh, went, we went for three and a half years where we wouldn't go near a church. The only time we went was on the anniversary, and this is weird, why on the anniversary of our son's death we'd go to Mass on the anniversary of our son's death and then stay away for another year, angry. And then the next year on the anniversary of his death we'd go to Mass again. Uh, didn't make any sense at all. Obviously, we wanted to be back in church. Yeah, it, made a, it made a lot more sense. <laughs> in retrospect, yes. Yeah. Uh, I would go into my bedroom and Bob, would, this was the first time in our life that we did things separately. We never, from the day we met, we've been best friends. But we grieved separately. And I would go into my bedroom and I would kneel and shake my fist and tell her. Out of God, she did not believe it. I said, I refuse to believe that you exist. 
So that was our background. Imagine if God could use us after that. He could use Who me. could he not use? <clears throat> so when God was really tired of all this, he came to the only one who had any semblance of brains, my husband. Well, <laughs> I... I'm going to ignore that last comment. Um, well, I'm, I don't, I'm I don't the know, civilized. I don't know Bob well enough to, to, make a, <laughs> to make an impolite comment, so I won't. You've got but civilized I, Irish, and you've got the emotional Italian. No, so I'm no. the civilized. <laughs> you hear that mother Angelica? <laughs> there you go. I, I want to go ahead and stop for just a moment, and I want to, to acquaint our, our listeners a little bit about uh, Bob and Penny Lord. Uh, Bob and Penny Lord have, in the last several years, traveled all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, going to different places of, uh, of influence for Christians, most especially the areas where saints were, and doing videotapes of their lives and writing books on their lives to bring out the, hero, the heroic nature of Christ in the body of Christ. Right. And there, how many books are out under uh, your name? 18. 18. How many videos are out. 150? 150, 150 different videos. <clears throat> the, the ministry of these two is just incredible. If you have a question for Bob and Penny, uh, and I, I'll usually say Bob or Penny, but in this case it's become very clear. It's Bob and Penny no matter what That's happens right. here. That's right. Please give us a call anywhere in Southern California at 1-800-500-4556. Uh, That's one 800 Five hundred four five five six, or if you're in the seven one four area code, seven four four nine six five four. And even though we are broadcasting live from Fargo, North Dakota, when you call that seven one four number, it's still local for you. Don't you panic. don't, you don't pay. <laughs> we will transfer the call up here. But when we came back, Rick, and we will ask this question until we die. We ask the question: How could we have ever left this church? How could we have ever left our beloved Savior and his mother? We both feel that if we had known that Jesus, really known that he was truly present in our church, that See, we could if, turn to him. If I would have known Jesus and our, our whole church, our heavenly family, in more of an emotional way rather than cerebral, because having been a cradle Catholic, we just grew up with this stuff and it didn't mean anything. And if Penny could have learned to know Jesus more with her head and not so much with her heart or a synthesis of the head and the heart, we never would have left the church. Had we known Mary, had, now I knew Mary the way Penny knew Jesus. I had a love affair with Our Lady when I was 15 years old, but this time it was not the same thing. And so we felt that they had both betrayed us and we just got rid of them. If my wife could have felt about Mary, Mary the, the lady who suffered when Jesus died, not the, not the Mary of the Pieta in Rome, Michelangelo's, where she's very resigned, but one that we see even in Paris, at the Notre Dame in Paris, where she's screaming at the death of her son. There is a beautiful, um, icon-worthy picture down that hall, right over there where I'm pointing, which our radio audience can't see. I was just going to say <laughs> that. And, and I, I've been told a, a number of different things you cannot do on radio. You cannot describe, you can't, I know. You cannot We've been describe told a sunset. Many times. Yeah. Right. Don't even try to describe a sunset. You cannot describe a, 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 a beautiful work of art, but I'm going to try anyway. This sketching is it's captivating. It has, it's called the presentation. And in the one corner, and it was done, by the way, by a man who I understand is in the East Coast who is in great personal pain. Uh, he lives now with his family again, um, going through quite a bit of his own struggles. It's the only religious work he's ever done. Everything else he's done is it. personal. Mm -hmm. it, it is, to me, it, I can't walk by it without being captured by it. Here is this, you, you see in the corner, Mary holding the newborn baby. Right. And she looks like she's exhausted. Then you have the presentation where she's been cleaned up <laughs> and holding this baby, but Towering over it is the cross, and she's holding like the Pieta, but the, 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 the silent scream of agony on the screen right. tears my eyes. Exactly, right. exactly. Because that's, what's, that's I, the way I it was. I don't cry very easily. I mean, yes, Blue, she's got all these other speakers that cry on the moment. I don't cry. And this thing brings tears to my eyes, yes. and it's that it's same true. type of agony that you can, you can tell comes out. And for some people, it is not a real savior to them. 
until they have experienced the crucifixion. Right. Mm, absolutely. And exactly. you've experienced the crucifixion. You know, we, we, now what did you do about it? 